Good evening and welcome to the meeting of the Wakefield School Committee of August 23rd, 2016. I hereby call this meeting to order. I will read the mission statement of the Wakefield Public Schools. The mission of the Wakefield Public Schools is to educate and inspire all students to be lifelong learners who are meaningful contributors to society and meet their academic, social, civic, and physical potential. We have a public comment period. Is there anyone here who wishes to comment on items on the agenda or other items of concern? Seeing none, we'll move on to the consent agenda. Move that the school committee approve the minutes of the August 9th, 2016 meeting as presented. Second. The motion's been made and seconded. Any uh, questions, comments, edits on the, uh, on the minutes? Okay, all those in favor? Any opposed? It's unanimous. Thank you. Move that the school committee accept the minutes of the August 8th, 2016 school committee policy subcommittee meeting as presented. Second. The motion's been made and seconded. Uh, any uh, questions or comments or edits on the uh, uh, policy subcommittee meeting? A uh, minute. Seeing none, all those in favor? Any opposed? It's unanimous. Okay, thanks everyone. Um, so under my comments, I just wanted to let everybody know that uh, Dr. Smith and I met with um, Dorothy Presser from the MASC, uh, the school committee uh, consortium. Um, late last week, we had a really good uh, conversation about shaping our agenda for the um, September 17 uh, school committee retreat. And we'll, um, I wanted to mention it tonight because I'd love to get some additional feedback from you between now and then on how to how to you know refine the agenda but but generally um, we're going to take some time to look at um, school committee norms and procedures to revisit um, some of our uh, basic uh, uh, sort of um, housekeeping items that are all if, if anyone is interested or, or wants to revisit some of those they're in the um, they're in the um, 200 section of our policy book. So 200 to 300 essentially are all about school committee. I went and revisited them um, just as part of that conversation. It's worth revisiting every now and then just to look at some of our norms and procedures, see, what, see what's working, see what's not, um, to uh, spend some time around the next phase of the superintendent's evaluation and have a good conversation with Dr. Smith, and then um, looking at broad um, goal setting for both the school committee and the in the district, um, both around the instructional strategy that frames our work, and then um, probably spend some time thinking about um, some of the big things in the agenda in the coming year, including Wakefield High School. Um, so, um, given that, did I cover everything? You said it's yeah. Oh, right, right. So, so yeah. So I want to make sure everyone has this. I thought this was really useful for me when I started um, the Essential School Board book. Um, so get extra copies for those uh, members who don't have it. I think RJ and, and Rob probably don't, but the others who, who may have had it or may have may need a new copy will will uh, will uh, order one for you. But but Dorothy's great. I think she'll be really. Um, She'll be a great facilitator for the retreat, so I just wanted to make sure I knew that. But in, in the meantime, um, if you have ideas, things, specific things you want to you want to uh, tackle uh, during the day, it'll be nine to two. I think we we talked about nine a.m. to two two p.m. Um, we're still looking for a venue. We've explored a couple of venues. I'd like to do something that gets us a little bit outside of our usual um, places of, of business. Um, but if you have ideas or specific things you want to tackle during the day, please let me know between now and the 17th. We've got plenty of time. Um, and I guess that's it for me. Okay. Uh, so uh, first on the agenda is I have Assistant Superintendent Doug Lyons here to talk about the professional development plan for 2016-2017. Thank you very much for having me this evening. I appreciate it. If I can queue up my slideshow here. Need some technical assistance. Um, it's not you. Hold on. A I was going to say, I think it's on me. Yep. <coughs> So I can go to something else if we think it's going to take more than a minute or two. <coughs> so just a matter of finding the right source button. Here we go. Hey, 
There we go. There we go. There we go. Okay. Great. Um, so we have a very brief slideshow this evening. This aligns with the professional development brochure that is in your packet. Okay. So the, the mission statement for the Wakefield Public Schools professional development plan is we believe in providing professional development that is responsive to the needs of all students, faculty, and staff. In order to promote a professional learning community, professional development will include clear goals, outcomes, measures, and opportunities for reflection, provide communication between faculty, staff, and administration, address legal mandates, district, school, and individual goals. It will use differentiation to promote professional growth and enhance current practices, and it will satisfy ongo ongoing, cohesive, sustainable objectives. So this mission and the professional development plan that I'm gonna talk about this evening is very consistent with the Wakefield Public Schools instructional strategy, which is what we use for a guide for our professional learning throughout the year. So the goals for 2016, 2017, these goals were created, these three bullets were created through the leadership and feedback from faculty and teachers throughout the professional development series that we did last year. So one of the things that the professional development task force very thoughtfully advocated for, as well as the feedback from teachers, they asked if they could have more opportunities to teach and learn from one another. They asked if they could have opportunities to learn in smaller settings, the way we're offering professional development in the five-part series, or sometimes in larger groups. They asked if they could learn in smaller groups, preferably with their colleagues from their school. And they also asked if they could please have more choices within the professional development that was taking place during the course of the year. So those, that information and that feedback that we got throughout the year last year is what set the stage for this plan and the goals moving forward. So this year we have 10 early release days. Five of them will be for professional development for our five part series. <coughs> and this year there are five choices within the five part series. And so that's important to note because you'll note from one of our, one of the goals is the teachers really ask for choice. So in the special education strand, there are two choices. Teachers can participate in five mini workshops that will, that will have smaller groups, and they'll be grouped by level, grades five, five through 12 and pre-K through four. Or this year, different than last, we're, we're gonna ask teachers if they would like to participate in an action research pilot, where a cohort of between six and 10 teachers will get together and do research in the topic of special education or ESL, ELL, um, to further um, the instructional strategy in which we're working. So those are two choices uh, in the five-part series. For our ESL, ELL strand, there will be three potential choices. And in this area, this is where we've had um, some significant growth as well as choice. So a, a third choice will be teachers can participate in Again, five mini workshops or lessons in sheltered English immersion strategies, or they can do an action research project that is specific to English as a second language or English language learners. And a third choice will, will be a coaching opportunity for teachers that currently have an English language learner in their class if they have completed the sheltered English immersion course that they're required to take through the Department of Education. So if they've taken the retail class, and they have an ELL, they can get individual coaching to put what they've learned into practice. So those are the five choices within the five part series, which we're really pleased to offer. Another thing that we're gonna be offering this year as part of in-district professional development that will not be part of the five part series, but I think it's important to note here, we will be offering our own sheltered English immersion course in district which up until now has only been offered through the Department of Education. So this is a Department of Education sanctioned course um, and teachers who take this course will be able to receive their SEI endorsement, which means that they can teach ELL students in their classes 
um, and they can also will meet the regulatory framework to um, renew their license. Okay. So in terms of stru instructional technology and open space, again this year um, we're going to host the showcase for grade 5 through 12 through 12 staff where they will share instructional practices with one another as we did last year which was very successful. Additionally this year uh, our professional day on March 17th teachers not just from 5 through 12 but pre-k through 12 will have an opportunity to share practices in, in an open space model and so in regard to school-based professional development school-based professional development happens on <coughs> Mondays happens during conference days so what principals and teachers be working on in those areas be working on supervision and evaluation um, special education training We'll be working on inclusionary practices, as well as school improvement plans, instructional support, and PD sessions to support curriculum and the curriculum review cycle. The asterisks on the slides, just like in your brochure, these are aligned to the Massachusetts standards for high quality professional development that are denoted uh, by the special, excuse me, by the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. So in terms of job embedded PD, um, our literacy coaches will continue to support teachers as well as our math coach, our curriculum coordinator. Um, we welcome a new science curriculum coordinator this year, Dr. Jennifer Thomas, who has been doing a lot of work this summer. We're just speaking to Dr. Smith this morning about how much work she's doing to prepare for our curriculum review cycle in science. So we're really fortunate to have her on board. So we're also going to continue with curriculum leadership teams. Our library media specialists will work with teams of teachers as well as classroom teachers to go in to support student learning and technology as well as literacy um, and connecting students to library sources. Our professional learning communities will be a place where teachers again can teach and learn with one another. Um, and we'll be continuing with our learning labs this year to kind of deprivatize practice and allow teachers greater opportunity to collaborate with one another. Additional partnerships um, and the coaching of the coaches, I call it. And so Leslie University will be a partner again this year with us. Um, we're also going to have a, 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 a consultant work with the literacy coaches and the curriculum coordinators, and, and he will kind of run their professional learning group to really work with them on coaching cycles and making sure that not only are we aligning our curriculum, but also that we're kind of making sure we're supporting the teachers the best we can. So that is a very quick overview of our professional development cycle for 16-17. I hope to come back and kind of give you an update later in the fall, um, but I'd be happy to answer any questions if you may have them. Thank you, Doug. Thank you. Um, we'll start, start over here with Chris. Uh, are these starting like uh, September 1st, those, those few days before school opens, uh, is that when you open So these? our first two professional days, um, so the professional learning will start in the first two days. Two days. So, yes, so yes, but, but they were not, they were not, those two, those days, two were days were not noted, were not noted, noted in, the in the slideshow. Are they part of the 10 or in addition to the 10? So they're in addition to the 10. So there are 10, so there are 10, 10 half days and there are three and professional days. days. One of which One I noted, I noted on, on there was March 17th, but the first but the two two used to start the school year. Okay, okay, thank you, thank you. Do you have questions? No, questions? thank you. Doug, and certainly to Dr. Smith, Smith as well, this, well, this, uh, this uh, congratulations, congratulations uh, I think, uh, for, for you guys, you guys um, um, the professional Task Force, task force as well as the administration. This is, this is uh, however, however brief, brief but, uh, but, uh, but, but thorough. thorough. Um, this, um, continues this continues to show, to show the collaboration, collaboration obviously, obviously between the administration, the administration and the teachers, teachers. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, the uh, and the success of this, of this as, a, as, a as a planning model, model. that just, just a short, short handful of years, years ago we were nowhere we're nowhere, we're nowhere close to where we needed to be with, with professional, professional development, development professional, professional learning, learning. Um, um, so really so a really kudos to to the entire team for what you've evolved as a really good calendar it seems to me that that the committee task force is Really well, really focused, well focused on, on planning, planning 
it seems it responsive, seems responsive um, thoughtful, thoughtful, and, and uh, useful, and, uh, useful. Uh, at least uh, the at topics, least the topics that, you've that you've rattled off, rattled you've, off. you've responded, responded to, to some, some, some inputs. inputs. I share I some share of this some of sort of offline, offline as well, as well from, from, uh, you know, feedback, feedback that we've received, received during the bargaining during the process, process. Yeah, not, yeah, not telling stories out of school, but this is obviously a topic of some conversations, very positive conversations, so it's really good to see that the feedback has been responded to in a positive way. Um, um, one of the things, things that I'm, I'm, pleased, I'm pleased to see, and there's a continuation, continuation of the learning labs, labs. I know we, we talked about, talked that, about that at your last presentation, that shows, shows again faith, faith, faith and you know and good, faith good faith and trust in the process. process. And, yeah. and, uh, uh, and it's, it's not a gotcha, gotcha moment, moment, it's a learning it's a moment. moment. So, so it's some really good, good stuff in here. I just wanted to offer that for two cents to the administration. It's really, really good. It's good progress. I wouldn't mind just making no, a comment on. about the PD task force and, you know, Doug's work over this past year with the PD task force has been excellent. And um, another, another piece, piece uh, you know, uh, in terms of in feedback, feedback, in addition to meeting with the PD with the task force each month, each month um, after, after every, every piece of five-part five series, five series or every professional, or every professional development offering, offering uh, uh, Doug, Doug would send, would send out, out a survey to teachers, to, teachers uh, uh, to get uh, to feedback, feedback from teachers, teachers all over the district. The district. How did it go? How, how can we improve? How improve? And then and that then was, was um, um, you know, he synthesized you know, that, that data and then and reported then back to them, this is what I heard you say. And then the PD task force would look at it at the next meeting. So I think just that really engaging the teachers in the feedback process, to both of your points, is a it's been a really been important, a really important part, part of continuing, continuing to, improve to improve and really and raising the level, level, the quality, quality and the level of satisfaction, satisfaction, I think, in the district. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the kind Thank words. Thank Thank words. The kind I words. I think, I think I, one, one thing that I would like to do moving forward is, you know, I'd like to have other staff, maybe teachers come back as well to to weigh in, to kind of share with you. There's one thing to hear my perspective. It's my job to do this. but. You know, for you teachers know, that are participating in the professional learning, learning to, actually to actually be able to come back and share, and share this is the, this benefit, is the benefit that we're that getting we're in getting terms of job embedded professional, professional development. development. Um, and I think the way, the way that Wakefield that is doing this doing and is doing this, doing this was doing this when I arrived. So let me be, you know, I don't want to overstate my work certainly, but the structures that exist here, and for example, the professional development task force, having a teacher team. Who is, who is, you know, you a built-in built feedback, feedback loop, loop that is very, very able, able and willing, willing to give you feedback, feedback not only not in, in terms of what needs, needs to improve, but also they're also, they're also very, very willing, willing to kind of roll up their sleeves, sleeves and tell you how, how we think it can improve. Can improve. Um, so uh, maybe uh, members of that group could come back and back back share back more with you as we're moving into the fall. I think that would be helpful in kind of hearing from them. Great, great. Yeah, I agree. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. Good. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. On this side? No. no. Okay. So, Thank you very much. So I've died. So I had a couple. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I went to wait. Just a couple. So, so um, just thinking, just thinking Doug, Doug um, about, about um, you know, you looking know, ahead at our budget planning, planning for next year. Do, and this may be for you or for Dr. Smith, do, do, or even or Mike, do we um, have a sense for um, the growth of, um, uh, the relative growth of uh, resources that we're putting into professional development with our current budget and what the needs are for the coming year? Is this something we should begin to think about now as we look at what you're doing? Well, I, well this, for this year, we had a professional development budget, um, and we were able to it wasn't, it wasn't overly, overly large, large by any stretch, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. so, but we were able to make some decisions and prioritize and align what we were doing in terms of the curriculum cycle and the instructional strategy, and I think you'll hear more about that, but um, I do think we will need to start to plan for our professional development budget probably as early as October okay. for the following year to start to think about you know where we want to be. All right, that's something for the budget, the subcommittee yep. to start thinking about yep. uh, later this fall. Okay, thank you. And then my other question was, I was thinking about this tonight because we, uh, in our reports from Mike, uh, we'll be looking at uh, the new uh, staff that's coming on. Mm -hmm. And do we have um, professional development strategy specifically geared toward new hires and as part of that strategy, mentorship from experienced teachers? We do. Um, mentoring was listed in, this, in yeah. the job embedded professional development. We have a, a formal mentor program 
um, and there's a coordinator that is assigned to that program. <coughs> All mentors are selected, kind of hand selected and matched by the school administrators. Um, our new administrators even have mentors as well. Right. So all new staff, as well as people moving internally in district, will also be assigned mentors if they're moving into a new position. So yes, there is a, a formal program, and that's something we think is is critical it is as so people important. transition yeah. from wherever they were to, to where they are now. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and just one other note, I think uh, Dr. Smith and I, in, in looking ahead of future agenda items, we thought, um, you had mentioned, Doug, the partnership with Leslie. We thought perhaps at some point during the fall we can have uh, Leslie back to look at that partnership and be able to ask some questions about how that's going. So so we're meeting with Leslie tomorrow at 12.30 or 1 o'clock mm -hmm. uh, in the afternoon. So uh, we'll be able to report back on how that our partnership with Leslie is evolving. Mm -hmm. All right, great, thanks. Thanks again, Doug. Thank you for having me. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Um, I think I'll bump up the agenda item that has my other guest speaker, Brennan Kent, so give him a chance to come on up. Back by you. popular demand. I was going to say, I told you that uh, <laughs> here he is again. Uh, but the, uh, the good news is he's always back because our uh, programs just keep growing under his <laughs> leadership. And so he's here to talk about uh, potentially adding a boys junior varsity golf team. Yes, uh, actually it would uh, be uh, unisex, so either boys or okay. girls. So, okay. um, Back to the title, yes. title nine yes. conversation. Um, yep. So thank you very much for everybody for having me again. Uh, I feel like I'm here a lot now. But um, as, as Dr. Smith mentioned, um, I am looking to start up a JV golf team at Wakefield High School, which we've never had a JV golf team before. Um, and really the need is um, just creating opportunities for our kids where, where there's interest. Um, and so regardless of what sport that is, if, if our kids are interested in a particular activity, I'm, I, I just want to create opportunities for them. And uh, talking with our golf coach who just recently retired, Dennis Biso, um, last year, after the season, um, I became aware that there is an interest um, in Wakefield for a potential JV golf team. Um, I had talked to Coach Biso, and we, we only kept 10 players, which I'll I'll get into the re rationale behind that in a minute, but um, Coach Piso had mentioned that we actually had 25 that signed up uh, to try out. And so if you do the math, um, we're, we're actually cutting more kids than we're keeping. And um, that, that just didn't sit well with me. Um, I, I, I always want to give kids opportunities to participate in whatever it is they want to do. So um, I brought this to Dr. Smith's attention uh, back in the winter time. Um, it was kind of on my mind throughout the winter. Um, obviously, a JV team would allow more opportunities for kids. It would also help our program uh, help you know develop younger players. Um, and also, this year in particular, we're returning uh, majority of those ten players. So if a kid didn't make the team last year, um, they're still going to have a lot of competition to make the team again this year. So um, I would hate to see a kid get cut, you know, one, two, or three years in a row. Um, so really want to give just kids opportunity to get out there and play. Um, so why only 10 players? Um, so this is customary throughout the league. Um, so how it's how the Middlesex League uh, has meets is eight players score. Uh, so you're allowed to have eight players out there and then two more alternates after that. Uh, so 10 players in total. Um, and part of the rationale behind that is is the courses don't want you know 70 kids going out otherwise their members aren't going to be too happy uh, so uh, five foursomes is really enough for them um, if you were to carry over 10 if you were to have a meet you know where would you put those other players um, you can't send them off even if we had another course you couldn't just send them off on their own uh, who would be supervising them who would be coaching them um, so there's really some kind of logistical issues there, and the majority of the teams around the league uh, carry it right around 10 as well. Um, so uh, Coach Biso, you know, had a great point of why why he only carried 10. Um, barriers to start up a program uh, for Wakefield in particular would be course time. Uh, so uh, this past spring um, in summer, it was really tough for me because Coach Biso took care of our course time. He was a member at Thompson Country Club. Um, which helped us get in there. That's where our team's been playing recently the past few years. Um, our returning players uh, expressed great interest in playing there again. 
I reached out to them. Uh, it was kind of in question for a little bit. I wasn't sure if we were going to get in there again. Um, we're extremely grateful that uh, Thompson is letting our, our varsity team play there once again. Um, we did used to have time at Bear Hill. Uh, unfortunately, Stoneham moved out of Unicorn, and Stoneham being the hometown team, Bear Hill took them on. So we do get a little bit of time here and there at Bear Hill, uh, but mostly uh, at Thompson. Um, difficulty f for having a JV program is you would need two courses, um, because if you had a meet at Thompson, you would need somewhere else for these kids to practice or play. Um, as far as courses around here, uh, there really weren't many options. The private clubs tend to cater to their, their members. Their members are first. Um, a lot of the public clubs, they'll uh, cater to their hometown school. So, for example, you know, Mount Hood is a, owned by the city of Melrose. You know, they're going to take care of Melrose High School first. Um, and then after that, they also have their, their men's leagues and women's leagues. Um, so finding course time is very difficult. Um, funding. Even when you do a course time, you still have to pay unless you have your own hometown team, um, which there is no publicly owned golf course in Wakefield. Uh, schedule, who would you play? There's not a lot of schools that have JV. Um, again, we don't have a course. And then also some head coaches just, you know, really aren't keen on adding added responsibilities to themselves. So um, as far as getting a JV program off the ground and running, um, we did have some hurdles to, to jump over. Um, very fortunate for us though, uh, this past summer I was looking around, uh, knocking on doors and calling every course I could. Um, and it just so happens that the old Colonial course, which is right on the border of uh, Linfield and, and Wakefield, just reopened. Uh, it's under the name King Rail now. Uh, so I called them up. I asked if they had any schools in there yet. They did not. Um, they were receptive of us playing there. I met with them, um, and we came up with a plan to allow us to play there uh, if we are to have a JV team. So as of right now, we do have two courses where we would be able to play. We have Thompson for our would be if we had varsity and, and King Rail uh, for our JV or practice for both. Um, funding, uh, King Rail originally, they, they wanted to charge us um, money per player. Again, uh, we really just didn't have it in our budget. Uh, the, the course manager was excellent. Uh, I said, can we come up with some kind of creative ideas uh, to help us pay for this? And being a course that just reopened, they're looking to draw attention, bring people into their course. So they are right now selling online, you know, Groupons and different discounts to play there, uh, trying to get people to come to their course. Uh, so we had a, an agreement um, if we were to have a JV team, um, if we were to help them sell some of those by promoting those um, and selling them as you know fundraisers, uh, that would pay for our, our tea times there. Uh, so it wouldn't cost our kids or our school any additional money. Um, scheduling, uh, we're very lucky. Our, our new coach was a JV coach before this. So he has a ton of contacts um, for different JV teams. So we do have a number of teams lined up. If we were to have a JV team, um, we have schools to play. Um, JV coach, we just um, hired a new coach over the summer. We had a, a lot of very qualified candidates. Um, so we do have people that are interested that, you know, we asked if, you know, you didn't get the varsity position, but would you be interested in possibly coaching JV if it was a reality? And um, some people expressed interest in that. So um, really, all the logistics are planned out. Um, I, I was just talking to Dr. Smith before this, unfortunately, though. Um, trials to this Saturday, and as of right now, we only have 15 um, play, 15 students registered to try out. Um, kind of the magic number we were looking at was 18. Um, the reason being is if we were to have uh, varsity and JV meet at the same day, we could have the 10 varsity players uh, play in the varsity meet and then eight uh, JV players play in the JV meet. Um, and then if we were to practice all together, um, really we wouldn't want more than 18 on the course. Uh, the course probably wouldn't you know, look too kindly upon that. So. Um, we're hoping that uh, a few more kids sign up. I have reached out to some of those kids that uh, signed up in the springtime that have not registered yet. Um, some of them changed their mind. They're going off cross country or football. And then some of them just have not responded yet. So um, we'll see. But uh, we're hoping to get to that 18 uh, number. If, if we were to get there, we would like to field a JV team. So.
Okay. Thank you, Brendan. So before we op uh, open up for questions, I'll ask Rob to read the motion. And, and uh, given the numbers, uh, we, uh, Brendan and Dr. Yes. Smith had asked for an amended motion, so Rob's uh, amended language. Move that the school committee approve the junior varsity golf team subject to sufficient student enrollment. Second. Okay, the motion's been made and seconded. Uh, questions? Tom? Yes, well, I think that this is a terrific idea. That first of all, how, how you opened is the stuff that I love to hear. You know, we want to be able to provide more opportunities for, yes. for kids that want to play. Um, so I'm certainly in favor of the, the original motion, never mind the, the amended motion. Uh, let me just ask uh, the, I guess, the administration's intent with the number, the magic number is 18. What if it's 17? I mean, how close to, I mean, is 18 yeah. the number and that's that? Or um, how, how, what are you thinking on that? So our coach is, is willing to, to work um, around that number. Um, the kind of the, the challenge, um, if we were to get 18, we would look to add a, a second coach. Um, the, the new varsity coach has already told me if we weren't to reach that number, he would be willing to try to make something work with those kids just as one group. Right, you know, instead of varsity JV, just one group, and maybe rotating those that ninth and tenth spot, you know, into that varsity mix. So it's not always the same nine and ten. Um, obviously, golf's pretty cut and dry as far as who the top eight is. The top eight scorers are are the varsity players. Um, but he's willing to work, try to work some magic around that if we don't get to that eighteen number. Because so. that is a that is a big number for one more one person to take on an additional. Yes. Right. 10 plus kids, yeah. yeah. Yes. But golf is labor intensive as a coach, too. Yes. Right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Chris. Um, will you finish? I'm sorry. No, yeah. I am. Thank okay. you. The, um, have you, is, is there a budget implication on this? Or, or, or user fees going to carry this? Or? So, we, user fees, uh, we, we've discussed, we buy the kids their, their uniform, we buy them balls, um, we f provide bags for them. So that's really where most of their user fees are going. Um, also, we pay for our Thompson time. We do pay Thompson a fee, flat fee for the year. They provide us tee times for our tryouts and then some, most of our home meets, not all of our home meets. Um, we didn't have enough money to pay for both Thompson and a second course. So we were very lucky uh, mm -hmm. to work this out. Um, how do you, how do you Cover transportation to use the, the white bus? Uh, yes, yeah, so we use a white bus. Um, as, far as, uh, as far as the location of King Rail, I, I believe it's so close that we may be able to get away with uh, parents transporting their kids um, because it's, it's less than five minutes away. So. Yeah. I, I, didn't, I, I know transportation to most teams is the biggest. Experience. Yes. Oh, yes, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, and we're allowed, uh, the, the white bus saves us so much money for, for golf. Um, and we're trying to work it out where if the varsity's home, the JV's away, um, so that uh, we're not, we wouldn't have to purchase, pay for a bus. We could always just consistently use the white bus, mm -hmm. uh, which would save our program a ton of money. So. Okay. It was now. Is that, is that the same vehicle that the uh, Post Academy was also depending on, though? Yeah, so, so we ran into some, some issues last year, last fall. Um, and then throughout the winter and spring, we were able to, um, to work out a, a schedule system where we were able to use it for athletics. Without, without disrupting we, their programming? Yes. We've purchased, a, we've leased a second van that was in the budget this year for Post Academy. So they now have two um, Toyota Sienna eight passenger vans which covers the majority of their needs. The only time they'll need to use the white the bus now is when they have a group outing where they want all the students and all the faculty from the Post Academy to go at one time. Mm -hmm. So that's, we've, we've, we think we've eliminated the, yes. the uh, <laughs> backlog of white bus need okay. uh, throughout the district. So yeah, that's, good. that was, just, that was an important problem, thing because so. you, it was definitely yeah. a backlog yes. last year. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. And? Um, so I just have a couple questions. I think it's a great idea because I, I like giving yes. kids more opportunities. And I think athletics is a really important avenue um, for students. But it, just in terms of the timing, is that it is going to have a budget impact, as you noted, that we'll have to hire a coach that was not part of, again, it's another surprise item that's not yes. part of our budget. So I'm just concerned that, you know, yeah. this probably should have been part of the budget process so yeah. that it, we could have seen it collectively. So that's my concern. Um, so. I, I already, I think I've reached out to Dr. Smith and Mike uh, about that 
uh, because right now we have budgeted in for one of unfortunately for one of our sports it looks like we're not going to have a freshman level uh, for field hockey. Oh. Um, unfortunately, the numbers just don't look like we're going to have enough Surprising. to fill a freshman mm -hmm. field hockey oh. team. Okay. And we already have that salary built in. To okay. The budget. So it would be a budget neutral. <laughs> yes. Okay. So it would be a it would be a budget neutral move. Um, okay. And and then the other piece that I was thinking of, um, in regards to helping the course sell those vouchers, if we reach, you know, a certain limit, could we potentially use some of that money as fundraising to potentially pay for an assistant coach? And they're open to helping us with that. So. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So. Good. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thanks. RJ? Um, Brian, just a quick question. You said we get some free golf course time yes. um, with fundraisers and kind of promoting their golf course? Yes. Okay, great. Um, well, first of all, I think I speak on behalf of the whole committee. Very proud of our um, sports and our school sports system here. Expanding, that's, that's, that's great. Um, and also, thank you for being proactive and thank you. Um, thinking of different avenues to save the town some money. I think thank I speak you. on behalf of all the taxpayers when we do Absolutely. that. So. Appreciate that. Thank you. Okay, any other questions? No? The motion's been made and seconded. All those in favor? Any opposed? It's unanimous. Thank you. Thank you guys again, Brian. Thank you. And keep obviously keep us updated on the numbers. Absolutely. And, yeah. Thank you. I'm Thank sure you, I'll Brian. find a reason to have you back soon. Thanks, <laughs> guys. <laughs> so we really do appreciate also the extra mile he's an extra length he's gone to to secure Hockey rinks and golf courses and and uh, everything else. Ropes courses. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So now I'll uh, I'll bump back to the community conversation for later start time. Uh, so in in your packet, I just included two pieces of information. So just as a reminder, kind of the what is that the um, the superintendents in the Middlesex League uh, had created a resolution. Uh, to explore uh, this issue of, of the possibility of later school start times with our communities um, uh, with, with the idea that we would come up with some, uh, some kind of a, an agreement or an understanding or a decision by the, for the 2017-18 school year. I think I had told you I entered as a new superintendent. <coughs> this conversation had already been going on for a long time and everybody was ready to sign when I was walking in the door. <laughs> so, um, you know, uh, my understanding is it's, it really is just an agreement to, to have the conversation. It's not an agreement that you're doing this. It's not an agreement that, you know, uh, of, of any specifics, just that you will explore the issue with your community. Uh, so that is the kind of the what. Um, the why, uh, at one point last school year, I shared an article, uh, which you can refer to um, by the CDC, that talks about uh, how early school start times are particularly difficult for uh, adolescents and could potentially affect their academic performance and their health. So that's kind of the why behind <coughs> it. So. Um, uh, Ms. Liakos and I just kind of talked through uh, how might we just kind of create a timeline for approaching uh, the conversation, you know, who are the people, uh, when might we have the discussion, and, and how might that occur. And so we just wanted to share these ideas with the committee for your feedback or input. Uh, certainly I want to speak to, um, you know, uh, Mr. Mayo uh, and fill him in on the conversation. Uh, and I would think that would be something would you know that I would want to do right off the bat, um, and then in the month of September, perhaps I would sit with my district and school leaders to share the idea, get some feedback. How would this affect you? What are some of the road bumps you might roadblocks or barriers that you might see? What are some of the um, in addition to obstacles? What would be some of the positives? And uh, have a discussion with school and district leaders. Um, at that point, uh, you know, we would probably want to turn to faculty and staff. I'd love to partner with members of the school committee for, you know, maybe from this, this point on um, in, in, the, in the process, maybe have a forum that we invite faculty and staff to to give us some feedback, uh, maybe produce an online survey that could be more um, utilized for more than one um, group of constituents. Um, and then I, I forgot to put the dates here, but for, for parents, and maybe booster clubs, um, also maybe in that October, early November time frame. Uh, also have a forum for parents um, and uh, in an online survey as well. Um, and then perhaps even consider sometime as we move a little bit later, maybe November to December, 
um, invite public, anyone in the community that would like to come here to a public hearing and talk to us live at a school committee meeting and also have access to the online survey. Might be a way to get a lot of feedback from our community. What do they think about the idea? Um, and to uh, and to have that conversation. We also talked a little bit about uh, some communities. I think put together a website or where people can look at research articles or have a opportunity to weigh in with like an online conversation or something like that. Um, so that that's uh, what uh, we j just in our first conversation wanted to put out there for you. And then in the meantime, the second page of your packet was I just recently received this email uh, about a week ago. Uh, NESDEC <coughs> is a superintendent's group, um, actually that you've utilized before for superintendent searches and so forth. Uh, they do a lot of different projects um, to support school districts, but they, um, they are running a workshop on starting school later. Um, and uh, so I noticed that there were two opportunities uh, to go and uh, two representatives can attend. So I emailed them back and said that, that I was interested in attending. And they provide you with, you know, so that you're not reinventing the wheel if you were to approach this. Uh, what are, you know, they give you a lot of information about people who've done it, how they've done it. And uh, they did, e this woman emailed me back um, again and said, do you have any particular concerns or things that you'd like us to address? Uh, in, in mind, and I mentioned a few things. Um, one is transportation. I said that in you know, Wakefield, we uh, count on a small fleet of buses to transport elementary, middle, and high school students, uh, you know, and that, so it would really affect everyone and everyone's schedules. It's not something, uh, I know Melrose recently added a later start time for high school students, uh, but they don't have uh, bus transportation, so it was as easy as just making the decision and doing it. Um, it would affect us differently since we have to worry about bus transportation. Um, I uh, talked about uh, from the standpoint of, uh, you know, uh, the collective bargaining process and working with our teachers union and what would be involved. I was just curious about that, any information they could give us and feedback on that. And then the third question I had, just from being a high school administrator, um, you know, one concern I might have and, and wondered if, if there's any data that um, talks about absenteeism and if teenagers are in bed after parents are still in bed after um. parents go to work. I just, I was wondering yeah, uh, how that might affect uh, kind of an opposite problem of who's getting that teenager to bed and pushing mm. them out the door and getting them to school, you know, which is a, which is a reality. So mm. that, that's one thing that I was just curious mm. about. Uh, I am uh, very much familiar with the research on sleepy teenagers, which I've definitely experienced that <laughs> as well. Uh, but I just kind of wonder, did anybody have that kind of data? So I just sent those three remarks back. And when they do this workshop, if those were questions that might be able to be answered. So uh, just looking for feedback or uh, your thoughts on how we might approach the community conversation for later school start time. One thing I wanted to add, I, I, and I can't remember if we touched on this when you and I spoke, Kim, but we wanted to make sure that this process didn't um, run into the high school uh, process as well, right? We mm -hmm. wanted to make sure that, you know, we weren't having public forums and hearings at the same time when we're also, you know, trying to get out there and solicit input onto the high school process as well, which will be later. So, um, meaning the statement of interest. Yeah, statement uh, of interest. Uh, right, lab. right. So, in <laughs> other words, trying to get some of this out of the way before all that mm -hmm. begins, essentially. So, I hope we, I hope that this outline does that. But we want to hear from all of you about ideas as well. So you can see we, we just sort of looked at the first yeah. half of the year with the idea to do it sooner rather than right. way too late uh, in the year. Ann, go ahead. Yeah. I was just going to say, I just think it's great to solicit community feedback and to think about all of the, the logistics involved right. with it right. because I think that the research is pretty strong that it does right. help yeah. students to have a later start time. I know that I teach at the university level and I used to teach an eight o'clock class because it was convenient for me. I don't do that anymore because they're so sleepy that we don't get much done. So I, the, my after, I found out that my afternoon classes, they do much better. So um, I, I think that there's definitely the evidence, but the logistics I think are really key in terms of the impact on families, on yeah. teachers, and you know, if we change, even changing teachers' work schedule, I don't know, all of us, if all of a sudden we were told that we had to come in at a different start time than what we're used to, that might be um, cause some issues. So I, I think that's great, good approach. Yeah, thanks. Tom? I, I concur with everything that, that Mr. Dan, he just said. Uh, I have a mechanical uh, question. <clears throat> um, uh, one is um, who, who would be the, I guess, the host or the sponsor of this? 
Um, is it the superintendent? Is the the committee? Is it just, or is such a thing even necessary? What's the what's the process by which we would that would that would run as a matter of mechanics? So I had that same question, and I would like for it to be both um, the school committee and superintendent together in an active conversation with our community, um, if if that was possible. It's fine. With me. I'm yeah. asking. I don't. Yeah. Have a, I don't yeah. really have a preference. Right. I was just asking the mechanics. Yeah, it's a good question. I, I, yeah, and I, I I I agree with Kim. I think it would be good if we yeah. are active partners in this conversation because I think, I mean, I guess I think coming out of the outcome of this phase of the conversation would be a sort of a summary, right, of, of facts. In other words, what this is, you know, this is the research, this is what we heard, and this is what we know, and this is what it would, this at least what we know about what it's going to take to make this happen if we agree we want to do this. And then we'd have to bring that back to this committee and say, okay, you know, and have a real full conversation about whether we think it's worth it. So, yeah. I think that's right. So just something to, to ponder, um, not to, to disagree with that point, but certainly the mechanics around the open meeting law give much greater leeway to the superintendent running uh, the process than by having I see what us, you mean. Us, yeah, yeah. We, we could be, we could attend, we could be active participants, and but if it's a superintendent's um, uh, our directive, right. It just a, just a, it doesn't mean just we couldn't do it. It just yeah. means there's yeah. more there's more square boxes right. around uh, uh, us running yeah, that process. Yeah, good point. Yeah. Uh, my my second question, as a matter of mechanics, is: Are we again, whoever we are, uh, prepared to take a position? Are we advocating a side? Uh, so we're going to, if it's a hearing of sorts, usually have a hearing about a motion being not maybe that mechanical. But is there? A, are we are going to be a proponent for something? Or are we just going to let? So, so I, I have a thought yeah. about that because yeah. I, I, and maybe you can tell, I haven't made up my mind yet. Uh, I really, I, I think the research, like Ann said, is compelling, uh, but I think the logistics and how it affects other people and maybe some more data would be necessary for even me to make a, a, my own decision on what I mm -hmm. think. Um, so my, my thought was that this first half of the year would be to, to hear all of that, mm -hmm. to help inform our thoughts, and then at that point, you know, perhaps we would, you know, um, think about what our, you know, stand or stance would be. Yeah, I guess we could, yeah, uh, one way to think about it was, it could be that after the fact finding and the research that then we ask Dr. Smith to make a recommendation to the school committee mm -hmm. and then we, and then, you know, we have that discussion mm -hmm. and take a position. I, I would be totally comfortable with that. I think that would make a lot of sense. Go ahead, well, Tom. Okay. So, yeah. um, my only concern about that is that a natural first question by everyone is going to be how does this work? Right. There, you know, there's only going to be so many people, no matter how much research we, no matter how many links we give them, they're they're going to read them or they're not. <laughs> they're going to be concerned about the mechanics. How does this sure. work? What time course, do my yeah. what time yeah. the kid get picked up? What yeah. time does the school start? Yeah. You know, you look at the the district and school leaders, faculty and staff, teachers. Everyone's going to ask that. So the fact finding is only going to the research and the, the expectation of people to go read is only going to get us so far. Not, right. I guess to be very pr yeah. practical about yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. So there is going to be a, an expectation. Of, well, how does that work? Yeah. Now maybe we can put out ideas without being a proponent for them. Yeah. But well, I think one of we just have well, to. I, one we of just can't let people have at it. Sure, sure. And I th but I think one of the things we can. I hope we can do between now and the time when we when we start this process is have a little bit of information about how other districts have done it. And mm -hmm. I think even more recently, two or three, obviously Melrose is a different animal in some ways, but, but there was another, at least two, a couple of other fairly uh, close by communities that have started this, and we can certainly learn from them as well. So well, I'm sorry, my last, one yeah. of the things that came out of, of the MASC, MASS conference last fall, mm -hmm was it the Newton uh, Public Schools, and I think I mentioned this at a prior meeting when we talked about this, the Newton Public Schools is um, sort of r r rallying this topic for the, the Metro West uh, series of communities. Right. So this conversation is, is, is occurring in other parts of the state as well, so right, it's right. obviously very timely. Um, but I went to that session run by uh, the Newton Committee, and they had representatives of a community that it did well in and a community that it did poorly in. 
Okay, good. Because there are there are both sides of the aisle, if sure, you will, sure. on, on uh, communities that have tried the earlier times and and what may so maybe getting maybe asking for a guest speaker or a guest that would be great. Yeah, there. yeah. If you could share, if you do yeah, still have a link to that, that yeah. would be great if we could see that. Chris, go ahead. I, I think a big part of the conversation needs to be. You know what other communities are also willing to do this because I, I I don't think you can pull it off as a standalone. It would have too big an effect on all the extracurricular right. activities. It's a mean, big if, consideration. Yeah. You know, if, if the after school activities are expected to start at two thirty because everybody else got out at you know two o'clock and then we go to three, then we're out of sync with everybody. So I mean, it's, it can't happen on its own. So I think that's why the Middlesex League superintendents. Um, you know, did the resolution together because it was also right. all of us agreeing that you know we'll work together based on the results of what each t all of the towns do. So, um, so is it possible that if the majority of other Middlesex towns wanted to do it, then we would almost be forced to do it? So, not that it's that if other communities in the Middlesex League decide to go with a later time, then everybody's clock will start later for after school activities. So, even if we decided not to do it, mm -hmm. it would just mean that it would, would just be, be maybe gap. 15 or 20 or 30 minutes later um, that activities would start. They wouldn't be starting earlier, they would only be starting later. Right. So, that would be the impact on us, would be that. Okay. And, oh, sorry, Rob, sorry. go ahead. Go ahead. So I was just, I think it probably all the questions around the table are a testament to what you said, Dr. Smith, about more data being needed about it. Um, my initial thought was that it's important, I think, that uh, a lot of the research uh, and, and a lot of the thinking behind it is, is presented, as you had said, Mr. Markham, beforehand. Mm -hmm. So kind of before we jump into these conversations, whether it, you know, manifests in like information sessions with the community about, you know, the research behind it, the pros and the cons, uh, in, in a manner that's digestible, Mm -hmm. I think you know so as to come at the, so as to come at the conversation, um, you know, on an even footing would probably benefit everybody more, um, you know, than just jumping directly into conversation. So I think that's a wise idea. So I think based on hearing that um, and and what you said also, uh, Tom, would be uh, we may be uh, jumping in a little early. To, to, it may not be realistic to jump right in in September. It sounds like having uh, some research ready ahead of time and maybe even some proposed schedules so people know what they're responding right. to because like I say it's going to come down to well how many more minutes you're talking uh, people are going to want to see maybe you know it might yeah. look like this or it might look That's like that and yeah. just so that they have they can uh, so we we may need it's to a little bump more this concrete yeah. yeah and if we're going to get some representatives from yeah. other schools or um, do a little bit of that research we may have to bump our timeline back a little bit to prepare better for these forums so people really we're not just walking in blindly right. and having a conversation yeah. I think is yeah. what I'm hearing. Sure. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. I was just yeah, gonna go say. Ahead, I was just gonna yeah. say that it's um, whenever we like doing consumer engagement for research, where we're trying to figure out what, um, how people are responding to an idea. The more concrete information that you can have, it's you get more realistic views of how they're really feeling about it. So if you do have the transportation issue figured out, could it be done? This is how we would handle transportation. This is would be the start right. time. The more concrete, um, then more they have something to right. They have something to respond to, and then yeah. you can ask them. You know, what are your concerns based on this? What would your concerns be? I also received this email about the workshop after we had put our little time yeah. time timeline together, kind of hoping they they will run the October twenty eighth one because right. I, I have a feeling that uh, maybe we, we will. Uh, receive a number of models and mm -hmm. a lot of really good concrete specific information mm -hmm. that we could use in the conversation. So many of these things speak to having to bumping our timeline back enough to be able to be well prepared mm -hmm. uh, with that kind of information. Could I? Uh, I just Anne's expertise in this area reminds me that we should um, take advantage of it because um, I think you know, as a pollster <laughs> of research. No, really. I mean, it's it is. It's. It's not easy to come by, so this kind of process requires a lot of expertise. And so, if you could help, oh, that yeah. would be tremendous. Yeah. Happy to. All right. Okay. okay. Any thoughts on this side? Uh, yeah, RJ, um, go ahead. A lot of Middlesex thinking 8:30 because I think that's what I read maybe a few months back. I think um, you know I can't remember off the top of my head what Melrose decided, but I, I don't think it was quite that late. I, I want to say it might have been 8:15. So I think it would be. So we start school at 7:30 for mm -hmm. high schoolers, 
which which is early. Um, so you know, even eight o'clock would be a pretty significant change. So I don't think it has to be as late as something like 8.30. I think it could be anywhere from 7.45 to 8.30, but somewhere probably in that window. And then the question is, what about middle school? I think we need to little look at the research there, too. Um, and then again, whatever we do will impact our elementary school students based on the bus situation. So. I do agree with Mr. Callanan, though, about extracurriculars. I do remember as a student, uh, obviously I would have loved another half hour, an hour, but kind of looking back, I think it really taught me some discipline to kind of wake up early, get the day rolling. Um, teen jobs and teen sports and teen ex extracurriculars all around, I think they could be affected. I don't know if I would have an after school job if we push it back. So 7.45, 8 o'clock, I think that's something I could support, but much later I think is pushing it. Yeah, and that, so that's the kind of feedback we're going to, going to want to get from people, mm -hmm. you know, and I think uh, that's to that point of what, what would be the window that you might support it, and when do we start getting out of that window, and that might give us the best and most realistic feedback from our community. So. All right, thanks. Thanks yeah, for the feedback. Great feedback. Thank you. Okay, uh, next on my agenda is just a school opening information and update. Um, so we're really excited. Um, just this morning, the welcome back letter went out to faculty and staff. Uh, tomorrow, the parents will receive their welcome back uh, letter from me. Um, and in each of those documents, we gave everybody just the basic information they need for school opening. So uh, faculty and staff report on September 1st. We have a full day of um, opening activities and professional development. And then on Tuesday, September 6th, we have faculty and staff again for that full, a second full day of professional development and preparation for <coughs> our students. And then our students join us on Wednesday, September 7th for a full day of school and the year is, is off and running. So we're very, very excited to have our students back. Um, what I shared with you in the packet are just some, some of the things that have been going on in preparation. Uh, so uh, last week we had our district leadership uh, retreat on August 16th and 17th. Uh, we spent two full six-hour days at the Northeast Consortium for Staff Development in Topsfield, which is a free location off campus where we could just work <coughs> and concentrate uh, together. So the district instructional leadership team um, was together for those two days, and I included in, in your packet our re retreat objectives, uh, all focused on uh, teaching and learning, our strategy, the implementation of our strategy. Um, we did uh, what we call strategic mapping, which is how it's one thing to have a strategy in print, it's another thing to actually implement it and, and to have it live in the actions and behaviors of people in your schools, from the administrative team to your school leadership teams, uh, to your you know, teachers in the classroom and in the actions and behaviors of students. So it's really strategically mapping how we would enact each of the strategic action plans. Um, we just talked about the development of our professional learning community model. We spent a lot of time about uh, developing teacher leaders in the district. Um, and I think that's uh, something that I'm really excited and passionate about. Um, and uh, so that was a big topic of our conversation. We did some of our professional development planning with uh, Doug Lyons. Uh, we talked about the implementation of Standard 5, which will be new for us this year. And then we just delved a little bit deeper into educator evaluation, our observation and feedback cycle. So um, I think we're well prepared and ready to go. It was just a great two days with our leadership team. Um, one thing I think that was just really exciting was that uh, every principal in the district uh, is coming back. We have no new principals and no That's new right. school leaders. Uh, every, everybody actually on the leadership team uh, is intact and it's, that helps a lot, you know. Um, so I think a lot of continuity moving into the new year. Uh, the day prior to our retreat, um, I had a two hour conference call with my executive team and uh, principals to take care of all of the management and operations uh, items that needed to be addressed uh, so that we could focus on teaching and learning at our retreat. So I included just the agenda items there. We talked about management and operations around curriculum instruction, you know, uh, putting in our, you know, are, are we ready to go with new curriculum? Are we ready to go with uh, our, our SEI, uh, you know, plan? Are we ready to go with our leadership teams, uh, our learning walk calendars, all, all of that kind of thing? Um, and then we talked uh, at length about other management operation pieces like personnel and hiring, food services, transportation, Wakefield Academy, um, et cetera. 
Um, and then we uh, finished off our meeting talking about some of the basic uh, school opening, opening protocols, uh, emergency protocols, data verification, uh, new teacher orientation, um, and following up on our summer reading and math challenges. So, um, so that's really what we've been doing uh, last week. And now everybody's kind of out at their school sites and, uh, and, and really, you know, the last touches on getting ready for our students. Um, one update I wanted to give you, last meeting I shared with you the transfer requests from the elementary students. So those are all complete now. Uh, they were all approved except for one, and the one that was not approved was a request uh, to go from one elementary to another where the class size was too big. Uh, but the family was very understanding, and uh, you know it was a, it was a hope. Uh, but we're we're satisfied with uh, staying where they were. So uh, that's the update on the transfer requests, uh, which had not been completed at the last time I saw you. Um, the next two pages in your packet are about the an update on the technology projects across the district, and an update on facilities projects across the district. So uh, in technology. Um, uh, we're really moving with our device sustainability plan. plan. Um, so we've, um, we're infusing new uh, Chromebooks, uh, new devices for students in grade five. So we have a whole new fleet uh, coming into that grade. And then the Chromebooks that they replace, so we're basically taking the, uh, the oldest or the, the, the least of the fleet out uh, as the new uh, devices come in. And those, though, they don't just go on a shelf. We use, we'll, we'll be using those devices uh, to, to supplement our supply of loaner devices to support BYOD at the high school, uh, to serve as extras at the Galvin when devices go out for repair, to make sure that education and, and teaching and learning at, at no time is interrupted. The student will always have a device, even if it breaks. There's one uh, ready to move in. And uh, the ones that are in somewhat of district repair will really be in a uh, a place for spare parts so we can do some in-house repairs the best we can if they're not working um, up to par. Um, our elementary school teachers will receive new devices sometime this fall uh, and again the devices they that will go out of service uh, will be again put to good use um, for the remainder of their usable life. Uh, they'll be assigned to paraprofessionals who might need them. Uh, they, some of them may enter the loaner device supply uh, as well. And, uh, and to continue to support uh, our needs when a staff device goes out to repair. So that's where we are with that. Um, the high school phones, uh, we are working now on phasing in a new phone system. Uh, this will, the work will, has started in August, but will carry into the fall. But this was the, uh, as you recall, from our capital planning and our technology planning, um, this is so that the high school teachers can call out, uh, you know, 911 and can call out of the classroom uh, on, on their phone. So that, uh, that work is underway. Uh, projectors, we, the installation of projectors is well underway. It's actually almost complete. It may even be complete by today. I think Jeff Weiner had told me uh, that by today or tomorrow, 90% um, of them will be in. There's a few new ads uh, that will go into the, to the school year. But um, so uh, projectors are, are um, mapped out around the district where we needed them. At the Doyle Early Childhood Center, we've selected TV screens instead of projectors based on the needs of the uh, teachers and students there. Um, so that's well underway. Uh, we were able to get the project at a strong uh, savings. Uh, so uh, because of that, we were able to add a few projectors that we weren't going to be able to afford at the beginning. And one of those is to put a projector in the Savings Bank Theater um, so that we'll be able to do presentations from the front of that space, uh, which is, you know, finally, um, you, you had to, you couldn't really use a um, remote uh, unless you were standing in the control booth. So, uh, so that's, that'll be a nice uh, add to that, to that room. We do a lot of presentations, both the school and the community do a lot of presentations in that room. Um, and then the server upgrade, uh, upgrade project um, is uh, phasing in new hardware into the existing environment. Uh, again, that'll, that work will go into the school year. Um, initially, they were going to set up a parallel installation, uh, but they've worked out a more stable uh, arrangement and uh, that has both on-site and off-site backup. So that actually will end up being uh, a financial savings um, on other services in future budget cycles, so that was good news. So that's the report from uh, technology and Jeff Weiner. 
Uh, Maria Soreo uh, pr provided me with a report on facilities. Uh, so there's been uh, a lot of cleaning and maintenance efforts across the district um, and the delivery of some of the capital projects that were um, uh, on the docket. Uh, I don't know if you noticed the ex exterior painting of the field house. It looks fantastic. That was very uh, battered looking on three sides. There was one side that was painted beautifully and the other ones hadn't, uh, had, had not been done. So uh, that is uh, finished. It looks really nice. Um, there is a major interior ceiling replacement project going on at the high school. It looks so nice. It includes LED lighting upgrades. Uh, you'll really notice it in the front lobby of the school when you walk in. Um, there's been some flooring replacements and uh, 50 additional window replacements at the high school and the uh, fire panel and public uh, address systems, uh, the upgrades have been completed. So that's the good news at the high school. Uh, otherwise, across the district, uh, we've done some interior painting, ceiling and flooring placements at Woodville, Greenwood, Greenwood and Doyle. Uh, Doll Bears had some uh, painting. Um, we've repointed and completed uh, concrete repairs at Greenwood, uh, Walton and Doyle. And uh, Doyle, uh, some really important work in terms of security has taken place. Uh, they're getting a new uh, card reader and uh, their public address, address system will be uh, completed. Uh, Post Academy uh, and now has, uh, I think, is the air conditioning done? Michael? Temporary, temporary solution. Okay, we have a temporary solution on air conditioning and uh, some new windows, um, some sound panels, and a new card reader for security and some area rugs uh, for sound. Um, Galvin is brand new, so it didn't really need much, uh, but uh, w this summer we had all of our summer programming at the Galvin. It went extremely well. Uh, even those who were skeptical uh, were very happy at the end of the summer. Uh, so that, that was great, um, and now that we're in full force trying to clean that building now and, and get it ready, uh, that will be done in time. And then finally, the Walton uh, Limited Scope Site Study uh, has seen some progress with the RFP uh, being released, and an informational meeting was held last week, at least according to Maria's notes, um, uh, that she would have attended. So uh, everyone's working really hard to make sure the facilities are ready. So that's my update on uh, getting ready for school opening. Uh, any, any questions from the committee, Chris? I'm, I might be off on my uh, memory here, but I recall at the doll there, mm -hmm. when they were uh, upgrading the computer controls, they could only do so much because they ran out of money and they had to complete that project at a, on a separate year. Is that, is that all finished now? You know, I don't, I'm not sure. Yeah, I think it went, it, they, they did a lot of the, the hardware upgrade, but there was a software upgrade that was needed also, and one part of the building, the old part of the building, was running on one software, and the new part of the building was running on a different software. I don't believe that that has been 100% resolved yet, but it's, it is on Maria's radar. It's, it's, a, it's a constant reminder on Maria's radar, so. I, I just knew it had been a problem, and it was, and I don't remember the exact numbers, they don't really matter, but there was so much allotted in one year and they went through it all but it wasn't enough to finish so they had to come can, back and yeah, finish we can find that out michael and i could ask and you about i just that knew it was just time. it had been left in limbo when we get to, when the town puts out the capital budget um they they lump a lot of things together and heating and cooling and ventilation hvac upgrade is usually lumped into one bucket and not usually specific to one building unless it's a major project for one building so they may put 50 or sixty thousand dollars into an hvac capital improvement plan so they can maybe replace some chillers or some blowers or something. And more than likely, it's it's in that bucket and probably something that will happen throughout the year if it's not already I would underway. just like to see it. I, I would love to see it. Trust, trust the, me. I mean, because you, cause you the, walk into the cafeteria and it's like an ice box and you walk into another part of the building and it's uh, not as well conditioned, uh, so. Well, and all, not only that, but operationally, we're spending more money than we should because we're not getting the efficiencies out of the system. Absolutely. So. I'll definitely ask Maria for an update on that. Other questions? Again? No. All right. Thank you. Okay. And I have just one more last uh, on my other. Um, so uh, just, you know, I, I send you all an email, but I, it's, it's really worth highlighting. Um, the, um, the development of Standard 5 as part of educator evaluation really has just caught on like wildfire. And, um, and so the last time I had talked to you, um, you know, I had gone to Washington, D.C. and came back. 
Um, but um, what happened since then was I received uh, an email from uh, Dr. Linda Darling Hammond's office. She's at uh, Stanford University in California, and she's one of the um, foremost uh, educational, you know, uh, education research literature uh, experts and uh, writers uh, in the country. Um, and uh, so I, I gave you a link so you could just look up who she is. Um, but uh, in my doctoral program, we read a lot of work by Linda Darling Hammond. Uh, but at any rate, um, a lead researcher from her office called and asked if um, they could interview me um, to talk about the work we're doing in educator evaluation. Um, and I guess uh, Dr. Darling Hammond is uh, writing a paper about innovative state and local uh, teacher evaluation systems and practices to share with practitioners across the country. And she was interested uh, in what we were doing. Um, she had heard about it through uh, the Cross State Collaborative uh, in Washington, D.C. Um, so I ended up taking a 45 minute interview, and it was, just, it was so exciting to talk about the Wakefield Public Schools. And uh, so I just I wanted to share that great news with you. So. Um, the researcher promised me that if uh, Wakefield shows up in the book, um, she'll give me a call and let me know. So, and, but she did ask me to send her a lot of the documents, including our standard five, and and uh, and I did do that. So that was very exciting. And then I had told you last time, uh, and and since then I, I have actually done it. Um, I presented. Um, the development of, of the uh, Wakefield Public Schools core values and instructional strategy uh, to 30 new superintendents in Massachusetts. Um, the professional coaching team for their induction program had uh, asked me to present uh, Wakefield's work as a model for um, uh, for how to develop a really excellent instructional strategy. So uh, so that was uh, it was great, and uh, just wanted to share both of those pieces of good news with you. So, excellent. That's it. Thank you, Kim. Okay, now we go to budget items, uh, business reports. Uh, thank you, and thank you for inviting me also tonight, along with Doug and Brenda. Um, I You're always welcome. <laughs> 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 I appreciate that. I'll always take you up on that, too. Thank you. Um, I, I did want to, uh, I was asked to prepare some, some budget reports for the, uh, for the committee, and uh, historically these come out after our close of month in August, um, because we really weren't, aren't ramped up with much, but um, I, I was asked to put these together, so I did, and I'll, I'll make a few comments on them, there's not a whole lot to report, but uh, under the salaries uh, category, lines one through six, you can see that we've expended about 3% of our budget, um, that's truly about uh, full year employees as well as summer school employees, our clerical staff, our secretarial staff, clerical and custodial staff, I'm sorry, uh, our administrative staff who's full year, as well as our summer school employees. We have not encumbered uh, any salaries yet, and um, you know, the, I guess the uh, simple explanation for that is that we are still in negotiations with several units, several, a couple of units, I should say, uh, and uh, encumbering salaries is a, is a very time-consuming process, and they have to do it twice, really, to me not knowing that I was going to have to be asked for business reports this week, didn't seem like it was the best use of my time with, with everything else that was on my plate. So um, that's why the encumbered salaries aren't showing up yet, but um, we do have a lot of money left in salaries, so that's, that's the good news. Um, under the contracted services, though, you'll, you'll notice that we have either expended or encumbered uh, all but about 23% or 77% of our, of our uh, contracted services have been accounted for for the year. Uh, and, and certainly in materials and supplies, you can imagine that uh, July 1 comes, or June 15th actually comes, and, and POs start coming in for next year for uh, all the textbooks, all the supplies, copy paper, uh, everything like that. Um, and you know, my staff has been doing a great job getting all the utilities encumbered. Um, the Special Education Department has taken great pride in making sure all of the tuitions are encumbered for the year, all of their contracted services, their home tutoring, their speech and language, and OTPT, and all their services that they require get encumbered. So uh, that's where a lot of ma the majority of the contracted services and uh, the supplies and materials are. Is they're, they're encumbered for the year, or uh, or WB Mason and Staples and school specialty orders are, are, are coming in by the truckload. So uh, schools <coughs> are in really good shape from a purchasing standpoint. Um, the second page, any questions on the first page? No. The second page is um, by location. Not much to report there. You know, most of our location is spent in salaries. The majority is spent in salaries. So um, again, windows unencumbered. Uh, the third page is, is not anything substantial. On, on the fourth page, this is our grants, and we are aware that we have been um, notified of four of the nine grants have an actual amount, and actually the, uh, 
the, the CPC grant, that, that's going to come in at the same number, what we projected, 147,200. Uh, so that's five out of the nine that we're aware of. It's, I just got the information from uh, Mrs. Goyette late, late this afternoon, so it, it missed the report. But uh, we're still waiting on some grants, and that's not uncommon. Some of these grants don't get issued or, or get um, awarded until later in the year, especially the ones that don't come through uh, DESE. Some of the early childhood uh, grants come directly from the Department of Early Childhood and Care. So, um, you know, grants, there's nothing substantial here. Uh, it's nice to see that the 240 grants up about 40 something thousand dollars, 46 thousand dollars from what we uh, got last year and projected for this year. Um, Title One's down a little bit, I believe. Um, yeah, about $8,500. Um, so, so there's, for the most part, most of the grants are up that have come in so far or, or level funded. So we're looking pretty good on grants, but again, not everything's in. Uh, on the revolving accounts, uh, those are traditionally our athletics, our school lunch, our performing arts, uh, things that happen during the school year. So um, I, I, the town really hasn't closed out the year for us yet. Um, so the balance forwards are my best, uh, my best guess through Munis, not guess, but my best uh, use of Munis that I could depict of what I thought the starting balances were going to be. Uh, those could change over the next month or two, just, just to give you a little heads up that if you see school lunch at 76,000, it could come in at 120. I think there's, there's a little discrepancy on that one. But all the other ones I feel pretty confident on, or that I'm, I'm pretty close to with the starting balances on those. Um, if you look at the balance on this, though, it, it does show that our revolving accounts are in a negative 354,000. Uh, certainly that's all because of um, the circuit breaker and we've encumbered all those tuitions already for the year and, and we won't start receiving those payments. Uh, and I actually haven't been notified as of yet what our circuit breaker reimbursement number is for this year. But i um, confident that we're going to uh, come in at least at budget, if not exceed budget. So. Any Mike, questions on those? Any other questions from the committee? Tom? Uh, thank you. Um, I guess an observation on the grants, which is probably good news for all of us, and I see a later agenda item when the, uh, uh, the legislators are coming, that we got an increase in the Metco grant. Yes. That's certainly something I know that we advocated for, and we spoke to the, even the, the parents we had our Boston meeting right. about about that. So that's certainly, um, that's certainly good to see uh, come to be. Um, Mike, on the revolving funds, um, it's really good news, even if, even if this is, you know, up, Unaudited, if you will. This isn't. This is your work, not Kevin Gill's. But mm -hmm. nonetheless, um, the, the fact that none of these balance forwards, none of these June 30 numbers are uh, have any uh, parentheses anywhere near them. Is, yeah, is and a usually really those good thing. usually those ones that we have to bail out through school committee funds will have a zero balance starting. Right. And, and right. athletics has been one that has been either close or at zero a couple of years. Everything is far above zero. I right. mean, I think we're. Right. Um, you know, I, I have to say, got an email earlier from Miss Lynn Scott uh, earlier in uh, late in July, maybe early August, that the preliminary numbers were really good, and that um, you know this was a, a good a good thing to see from the school department that all of our revolving accounts were were above board without any transfers or anything. So um, you know, I, I, certainly I'm not taking the credit. I think Brennan's done an exceptional job with the athletic group, uh, Jeff uh, Boyd with the with the academy. Um, you know, certainly Tom Banker with the performing arts is always above board, but the, you know, uh, and Kristen with Kristen and Lisa at the school lunch department have just turned that totally mm -hmm. around. That you know, it's, it's having great people surrounding us is really helping us not have to put in the positions that we're stressing at the end That's of right. the year and and taking a few things off our plate that we've we've had to stress about in the past. So it's it's, yeah. it's good. I agree. Thanks, Tom. Yeah, so that's a good point. I, I, I think, you know, you, you, you're being understandably humble, but certainly the, the, the business administrator's role is to make sure that uh, to work with the other department heads that have some oversight over their revolving funds to make sure all those things are happening. So um, notwithstanding uh, the understandable humility <laughs> that you're bringing to this, uh, you certainly deserve some kudos. This is not uh, the type of things that we were seeing uh, a handful of years ago. So really, really excellent work. Uh, and even the, the negative that you're showing, that's sort of, that's, that's, that's paper money. That's not real money. <laughs> On the, uh, On yeah, the, that's the, the circuit, circuit breaker. breaker yeah. 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 You've just yeah. encumbered the year, right? Right, exactly. You've encumbered the full 12 months. For, um, for tuitions, for I believe. Spent um, tuitions. Patty Jackson and Lynn have yeah. fully which is an appropriate fully thing to do, but that's put in not, all, all that's of money's their, not out the door right, yet. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Oh, it certainly wouldn't be going out until no. June. The last payments will be going out in June, so we've got ten months ahead of us of good things to good do. stuff. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. Other questions on the business reports? 
And uh, do we have a personnel report? Um, so I, I apologize. We are um, we've restructured a little bit upstairs in the central office, and um, probably a little miscommunication on my part. So I'll, I'll take uh, a little bit of hit hit on this one. Okay. But, um, we're trying to get all the payroll loaded, and that's okay. taking our priority. And maybe I communicated that this person our report didn't get communicated out properly. So okay. I'll, I'll take that on and that. This one. was I, this was going to be the new hires. Right? Yeah, and, right, and, right. and we okay. are still onboarding okay. people, and um, okay. you know they're 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 making sure that we have all the people in the place. Right. And and I I did think that that was a little bit more critical, and, and not to say that it wasn't important to inform the school community of who our new hires right, were, right. but I, I need to make sure that they were in payroll, they were set up. Um, uh, we have to run our first payroll next week for for the school year, so right. um, it, that was that was kind of 400 and something full-time employees plus all the substitutes and and uh, part-time employees and everything just kind of took a little priority, so I apologize. So that's okay. So we'll have that in the next agenda. I yeah. promise you. That okay. We'll be I, in the next I, agenda. I do have one, one, one Go ahead, Chris. Yeah. Do you know of any unfilled positions? There are possibly. Uh, uh, there are a couple of long-term sub positions that haven't been filled. We have some pregnancies, um, some maternity leaves that are uh, that are facing us, and they're not for September one, but later in September. Um, and I know that there's a couple of positions that might be a 30 to 60 to 90 day positions that are not yet filled, uh, and those are typically a little harder to fill. And um, I've been approached by a couple of administrators saying, "How can you help me fill these? You know, you've got me on a tight leash with the money, and I'm, I'm you know." So I just say, "You got to talk to Kim." <laughs> <laughs> so and we're, we're closing in on everything there's a you know uh, if there was a late resignation or uh, you know uh, then those obviously is a little bit of a domino effect there and we you know but uh, yeah but we're, we're in really good shape I think many districts deal with that and I see it on listserv a lot last year I haven't seen it yet this year where where administrators are, are up in arms about districts stealing their employees on August 31st and not giving a two-week notice or a two-month notice or any notice or you know it's well, difficult. So that hasn't hit us yet. I think we're, you know, again, I, I think we're, we're retaining some really great employees. With people aren't jumping ship. It's a good thing. Um, and, and, you know, most of our positions are filled, but there are a couple that are, that are still hanging out there. But okay. I do, have an, okay. I do have another update, though. Just oh, going ahead. really quickly, and I, I don't mean to take up much time. Um, we've we've uh, completed our bus routes for this year. Um, we're, we're still in draft mode, but we've completed them. We've sent them off to the bus company. The drivers, if you, you've, people may have noticed Wakefield buses on the streets the last couple of days. They're driving the routes to make sure everything times out, everything's accurate. Uh, we do intend to publish those routes to the families um, this week. But a couple of highlights. Um, we went into the bus routes or bus planning this year with a couple of goals. And one was to uh, remove the middle school, high school joint buses in the afternoon. Um, and the other goal was to, uh, there were three goals actually. The second goal was to, um, try and incorporate a late bus from the high school and middle school for those students who needed to, who chose to stay later to, um, to get additional supports. Um, and also to uh, assist our Metco students somehow in getting to the T station uh, if they wanted to stay late for support. Um, so I'm happy to report on the, on the combo buses. Um, we're gonna run two dedicated buses out of the high school in the afternoon and three dedicated buses out of the Galvin in the afternoon. There is a six bus and just the sheer numbers, I, I do have to run one combo bus it's going to leave the high school. It'll go directly to the Galvin, uh, and then proceed out to I believe the west side of town. It's just a, kind of along the way. So I set it up so that it was Galvin was along the way to pick up additional kids, and it wasn't you know the bus leaving here and then going out to Montrose or going down to Greenwood or, or something else. So that was that's good news. Not a, ideal. Not as not as good as we wanted it to be, but I think we made great strides in getting to um, to, to most of our buses being segregated between high school and middle school kids, uh, students. Um, the late buses, um, we, we run six buses in town now, only five at the elementary. So we are gonna run a late bus every day, Monday through Thursday, not Fridays, but Monday through Thursday. It'll leave the high school approximately 305, go directly to the Galvin. So this will be a segregated bus. I mean, I, I mean uh, an incorporated bus, not segregated. Integrated. Integrated, thank you. Um, pick up the Galvin students, and then uh, from there, it's gonna go to the, the Greenwood T Station to drop off the Metco students, if they need transportation on the, on the T. Uh, hit the Greenwood school, loop back around, hit the Walton School, hit the Dolbear School, uh, and it probably hit somewhere like Montrose and Lowell Street so, um, so that we can hit that, that edge of town also. And then possibly come back to the Woodville, just I haven't figured that out yet because we are picking up the Galvin kids. We tried to hit every elementary school. We they're kind of neighborhood schools that were kind of a good stop. We didn't want to have 20 stops. We, we identified four or five stops for the late buses. Um, it gets us one downtown when they hit the Galvin, Teeth Station, Greenwood, Walton, Dolbear. 
uh, and then possibly back to the Woodville. So um, that's something that uh, Mr. Colantoni and Mr. Um, Metropolis were were really uh, pushing pushing for, to get because they, they felt like students weren't given the opportunity to stay late for help. So uh, I think that's uh, a great accomplishment that we that we were that's able great. to incorporate yeah. that. So just want to give an update on the buses. Great. Thank you. Uh, okay. Uh, vote to subcommittee reports. Uh, budget. Uh, budget subcommittee is meeting this Friday, Friday. at seven. All right. Thank you. Uh, labor relations. <coughs> we have. Um, after a couple of weeks of a hiatus of sorts, although there was lots of work going on in the background with preparing language and such, uh, we've now got our full schedule um, with a meeting today, tomorrow, actually two meetings, um, three sessions next week. Um, so we are working toward um, the, the goal of being able to um, have um, a full public uh, conversation on the at the September 13th meeting. Great. Um, my um, I guess request or recommendation uh, would be that we uh, schedule an executive session prior to that, either immediately prior or even potentially the day before or the 12th or something, if, if possible, to allow uh, for you know for thought conversations right. and Q and A before the uh, before the the, the, pub, the public conversation. Okay. So I'd leave that up to you, or maybe guidance from the rest of the committee. But great, um, great, yeah. It, so it is our goal. We've yeah. been driving toward that vote on the right. 13th, so okay. we're in a really good place to, to be there. Okay, so if uh, members want to uh, email me and, and let me know what they'd prefer, I'll do a sort of informal poll whether you want to do something right beforehand on the 13th or the day before, um, and we can uh, we can uh, work that into our schedule. Thank you. Okay. Um, and uh, and finally, policy. Yeah, we've got so, some motions. Yes, we do. So policy actually also met right before this just to discuss some language about the field trip policy. So that one will have an amendment, but I'll get. I'll get to that after the okay. first two. Move that the school committee approve the subcommittees of the school committee policy 209-E as presented. Second. The motion's been made and second. Uh, question. That's Everyone. the substance. That is the subcommittees. Subcommittees. That's subcommittees. Policy on subcommittees. Right. This was the uh, growing out of the conversation around the policy, uh, excuse me, uh, subcommittee reorganization. I yes, should, Anne, go I ahead. I just please. had a quick question. Should yeah. we have some language in there about um, about the role of non subcommittee members and their ability to speak or not speak during the subcommittees? I know that that's come up. Was that in there? Did it's I miss not. That? No, I didn't. I don't think that we have any of that in there now. It's not in there. Like, I don't know whether it's. I don't know whether it's worth it or not. I just. I think it's elsewhere. I think it is um, in. We have um, language in policies around open meeting. Okay. Um, in some of the uh, norms and procedures. Okay. I think it's in there. Okay. That's fine. Um, it's covered. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead. To, to follow up on Ann's point, I, I'm not questioning that you, you at all. Yeah. Um, but it may be good, even if it is redundant, to also put it there because that's one place that that, that question comes up a lot. It does. Mm -hmm. It does. The question really yeah. comes up yeah. a lot. And to say, well, it's not here, it's here, and then someone yeah. spend 50 yeah. minutes looking for it. Um, it, it, it seems that uh, you know whatever the reflection is in the prior policy, which I assume is consistent with open meeting law. Um, my two cents would be that maybe we just add it. Uh, not necessarily we know what it is tonight. Right, right. But because um, that comes up a lot, it does, and there's yeah, a you yeah. know does a what happens if there's four school committee members at a subcommittee meeting right, and right. you know what does the, the dynamic change and all of that. I, sure, we can't be too clear on that because. It, it, it has happened. Okay, sure. Did you have a thought? No, on that? I was. Yeah. You clarified, Mr. Morgan. That was my question. Um, I, my original thinking was that would exclusively be governed by open meeting law, mm -hmm. um, but I think to your point, to restate it again is not. You know, you can never say it's safe. Sometimes times. redundancy is a good thing. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> so, is it the um, sentiment of the committee that we that we wait on this for a couple of weeks and add add some language? I'm sure the language wouldn't be hard to. Um, there, would, there's an MGL section that. That we can just pull reference. from. Yeah, yeah. Does anyone have any objections to, to holding off a couple of I don't weeks? necessarily have an objection, but I wonder if you, in terms of assigning subcommittees, would rather have this done so you can get started on that. And then, I mean, that sounds like just an easy addition yeah. to amend. Okay. So, um, okay. So then uh, we would approve that tonight at, um, and then amend it subsequently? I'm sorry. I was, I'm well, I think we'd probably need to finalize the language, and yeah. then we could just bring it back on the table. Yeah. No, no, I'm totally, I'm yeah. totally fine with I think that. that. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Okay. 
and okay. run such language by town council. Town council. Right, sure right. Yeah. Okay. Oh, I, I would support Mr. Tiro's idea. Okay. Sure. Okay, that's fine. So we'll withdraw the motion. Is that? So I think we can no. still vote on this motion tonight, and okay. then we'll just bring it up again. Okay. That way, uh, you, that that way you can assign subcommittees. So okay. Yeah. All right. Fine. Um, any other thoughts on the motion? Okay. All those in favor? Opposed? It's unanimous. Thank you. Okay. Move that the school committee approve the illegal substances and alcohol policy 1005 as presented. Second. Okay. A motion's been made and seconded. Questions or comments on this one? Straightforward. Okay. All those in favor? Any opposed? It's unanimous. Thank you. And finally, field trips. Okay. So I'm going to move to amend field trips policy 904-E currently on the table to include the following as the first sentence. Student field trips of significant educational value shall be encouraged and permitted under rules established by the superintendent that shall address, but not be limited to, such issues as safety of transportation and accommodations, cost, including expectations for fundraising by students, time away from school, appropriateness of the field trip for the grade level, and the trip approval process. Second. Okay, the motion's been made and seconded. Um, Maybe before we open it up for questions, do you, uh, Robert, you want to talk about the additional yeah. language and where that came from? So my thanks to Ms. Morgan for bringing this MGL before me. Um, that uh, bit that I had just read is a direct quote from MGL 71, uh, section 37N about uh, policies on school-sponsored student travel, and it just states that school committees must have a policy that speak to those things. Um, in discussing that with Dr. Smith, obvious, Dr. Smith, obviously there was nothing in there that wasn't already being done. We just right. needed to mm -hmm. memorialize it in a policy, and it's something that we've historically empowered the superintendent um, with them and her building principles with handling, so it's something we just inserted a bit of language in there to put in our policy. Okay, thank you. Questions, comments? Thanks, Kate, for flagging that. Uh, all those in favor? Opposed? It's unanimous. Okay, thank you. So now then, do we need a vote on the policy itself? It was th that was just a vote on the amendment. To add that in, do we also need a vote then to adopt I think it the policy was, uh, as amended? amended it, it policy. was policy as amended. Okay. Yeah. Okay. okay. Uh, future dates and agenda items. I talked about the retreat. Uh, Tom mentioned the uh, executive session. And uh, again, if you can give me your uh, preference on that on the 13th, and then um, uh, we'll have the uh, state legislative delegation back on the 27th. Um, I guess that's it. Any any uh, thoughts or comments on future agenda items or uh, dates? Okay. All right. School committee comments. Want to start over with RJ? I'm good. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Good. good. Okay. Chris. Great time in the uh, dunk tank. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Italian festival. Uh, it, was, it was a great afternoon, and we had a lot of activity. It was it was good cause, and the uh, the benefactor of that was the uh, the scholarship foundation. All right. And I try, for the record, I tried to dunk Chris, but I failed miserably. <laughs> <laughs> Three tries. Yeah, but that 14 year old got me. <laughs> <laughs> he, he, he was a ringer. <laughs> Thanks. Tom? Uh, just a general uh, good, uh, good wishes to all in the opening of school, both the faculty and staff great. and students. Yeah. Yeah. Here's to a great, successful opening for the first day of school for all the students. I see that high school orientations tomorrow for mm -hmm. the freshmen. For the freshmen, so yeah. I was thinking they must be so nervous. <laughs> <laughs> but they'll all do great. So. Mm -hmm. Well, there's a nervous uh, parent in, in this room. Oh, oh, that's right. Yeah. My daughter, when my daughter <laughs> came, my daughter and her friend, when they were, went to high school, they came up and wanted to go together, even though they lived on opposite sides of town. So they went together and we picked them up together. And they came out. I said, "So how was it?" They said, "We're going to school with men. They have beards. <laughs> <laughs> there are yes. people there with beards." Welcome to high school. Thanks, Rob. All set. Got comments. Okay. Motion to adjourn. Move that the school committee adjourn its meeting of August twenty third, two thousand sixteen. Second. Second. Motion has been made and seconded. All those in favor? Awesome. Well, the meeting is adjourned. Thanks, everyone. I have some warrants if anybody's available.